Good morning, church. Morning. 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 Good to see you all here this morning. Thank you. <laughs> Don't you just love sung worship? I'm going to say it's sung worship because I've got a point. I love sung worship. Anybody who sat in front of me will probably tell you that I get quite loud and enthusiastic. I'm sorry. <laughs> Anybody who's been on the whisper mic, when I've been leading doing the whisper mic, you've heard me. I get enthusiastic. But worship doesn't end there. Worship doesn't end when we stop singing. We worship with our offering. And then we also worship while we're listening to the word of God. And we worship once we get out that door. And so all I ask you this morning is to put aside distractions, put aside everything you you might be doing right now, what's interesting you, and let your heart be ready to hear what God's got to say to you. Not necessarily what I've got to say, let the Spirit work in your heart. Let the Spirit open your ears, open your hearts, have a heart of flesh this morning and not a heart of stone, and let the Holy Spirit interpret what he wants into your hearts. Let's just pray. Thank you, Lord, that you made us to worship you. That is our primary purpose. We thank you, Lord, that you love us so much. Lord, and though I can speak words and be loud, it's your spirit that does the work. Although I can be here and have something planned, it's your spirit that does the work. So this morning, Holy Spirit, we invite you to come in and take what is said into our hearts And if we need to respond, then we will respond, we pray, in Jesus' name. Have your way here this morning. Be Lord of this place. Be Lord of what I say, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, last week we heard about the myth of the super saint. And the one super saint that was, of course, was Jesus. Although not everybody went with this. Not everybody was quiet. There was a whole crowd that followed him. Loads of people hung around Jesus. If we look at Matthew 4, 23 to 25. I'll give you a bit of time to find that. Those of you who brought your Bibles with you or tapping the numbers on the phone. And he went throughout all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction among the people. So his fame spread throughout all Syria, and they brought him all the sick, those afflicted with various diseases and pains, those oppressed by demons, those having seizures and paralytics, and he healed them. And great crowds followed him from Galilee and the Decapolis, and from Jerusalem and Judea, and from beyond the Jordan. Jesus pulled out quite a following, great multitudes, they were running around chasing after him. But there was a variety of people in those groups following him, in those crowds. There was the the crowd itself, those sort of wanting to hear some teaching. They said of him that his teaching was not like other men, that he spoke from God. To see miracles, a bit of sensationalism, you know. (laughs) Hey, I've seen a miracle. I can go home and tell my friends that I've seen Jesus, I've heard him talk, and he did this fantastic miracle. This man got healed, this woman got saved, healed. So they had a story to tell so they could boast to their friends but he had compassion on them, and he healed their, whatever their reason for being there, he healed their sicknesses and set them free. And then he was followed by people who had specific needs. They were chasing after Jesus because they wanted something. The centurion whose whose son was dying, or servant was dying, Jairus and his daughter, the woman with the issue of blood, the blind man by the road, they knew that Jesus was the answer to their problem, and no one else could help. They'd got to the end. And they needed somebody who could help. And perhaps, no, they, they joined the wider group of people who were, could be considered more like followers. I'm going to read you Luke 5, 17 to 22. One of those, on one of those days, as he was teaching, Pharisees and teachers of the law were sitting there who had come from every village of Galilee and Judea and from Jerusalem. And the power of the Lord was with him to heal. And behold, some men were bringing on a bed, bed, a man who was paralysed. And they were seeking him to bring him in and lay him before Jesus. But finding no way to bring him in because of the crowd, 
they went up on the roof and let him down with his bed through the tiles in the midst, into the midst before Jesus. And when he saw their faith, he said, man, your sins are forgiven you. And the scribes and the Pharisees began to question, saying, who is this who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? When Jesus perceived their thoughts, he answered them, why do you question in your hearts? Which is easy to say your sins are forgiven or to say rise and walk, but that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. And he said to the man who was paralyzed, I say to you, arise, pick up your bed and go home. And immediately he rose up before them and picked up what he had been lying on and went home glorifying God. And amazement seized them all. And they glorified God and were filled with all, saying, we have seen extraordinary things today. So even in that, you've got some people who are amazed by what they'd seen. But you also had the critics. Those who didn't think he was the Messiah. Those who were thinking to to trap him, the scribes and the Pharisees. And they came and gathered. And they're in the crowd, causing a bit of trouble maybe questioning who this man was who, who, acquired, who aspired to do these things, who aspired to do miracles, who aspired to forgive sins. And to them, that was true blasphemy. They wanted to test him later on and discredit him. They wanted to trap him and gain evidence to kill him, to report back to their council, to prove that they were righteous and he was wrong. They were not, and then there were some of them who were perhaps a little bit more on the edge, we can think of Nicodemus, who came to Jesus by night. Now, we don't know if he came by night because he was scared of his mates or whether that was the only time he could get to see Jesus on his own. Both are possible. But he came to Jesus by night. We have tradition that says that perhaps Joseph of Arimathea was one of these as well because he asked for the body of Jesus. So even amongst the scribes and the Pharisees, there were people who were following him for the best reasons, to believe in him. And then there was the more committed ones. Jesus often talks about 70. He sent them out. 120 in the upper room. You know, that was not just the 12. That's other people. But these were followers of Jesus. And then there was the 12. These were his disciples. They'd come to learn from the rabbi. And it's strange that if you read the commentaries around the the, the calling of disciples, rabbis usually expected the disciples to come and find them. But Jesus went out and called and found his disciples. Completely counterculture to what everything else was around him. Jesus had a good point for picking the people he picked, just as he's a good point for you being here. And he asked them, he gave them details of his teaching. They got the parables explained. So, in some ways, they were in misadventure his bodyguard, because they were big and strong and could stop children getting to Jesus. And they had counted the cost, some of them. And they experienced the more intimate miracles, the calming of the storm. Peter walking on water. You know, yeah. Peter shouldn't have been the person he was after all he experienced, but yet we're all like that too. Yeah. And Peter, James and John were even a more inner group who saw the transfiguration on the mountain. So there's a whole crowd, a variety of people were hanging around Jesus. Not all of them were there for good reasons. Not all of them were there for the best reasons. They perhaps didn't hear what he was saying. Or perhaps they didn't listen to it because they heard. But it made no effect in their hearts. It made no difference to their lives. For various reasons, perhaps they didn't think Jesus had the right credentials. He wasn't qualified. He didn't go to the rabbi school and have a degree from there. Or they didn't want to pay the cost of following Jesus. But even those 12, they didn't spend all their time with Jesus. They came to a point, and we don't know where it was, because we're not quite sure how chronological the synoptic gospels are, but there came a point where he sent them out. If we go to Matthew 10, I'm just going to read a little bit of that to you. Matthew 10, verse 1, and then 5 to 15. So Jesus is sending disciples out, and he names them. That's why I've missed out the verses 4, 5. Sorry, three, two, three, four, and five. It doesn't really matter that much. And he called to him his 12 disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal every disease and every affliction. Just a reminder of that. Obviously, at that time, the Holy Spirit wasn't put out onto everybody. It was when Jesus commanded or God decided that somebody, the Holy Spirit could come on somebody. Before that, we're much more advantaged than that. 
Then 12 Jesus sent out, the 12 Jesus sent out instructed them, go where among the, nowhere among the Gentiles and into no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel and proclaim as you go, saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse lepers, cast out demons. You receive without pain, give without pay. No bag for your journey or two tunics or sandals or a staff, for the laborer deserves his food. And whatever town or village you enter, find out who is worthy in it and stay there until you depart. As you enter the house, greet it. And if the house is worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it is not worthy, let your peace return to you. And if anyone will not receive you or listen to you, your words shake off the dust from your feet when you leave that house or town. Truly I say to you, it will be more bearable on the day of judgment for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah than for that town. That was real power. That was real authority was given to his disciples. Something they did in that person's house could really impact on that house and on that city. So he didn't send them out straight away. He spent lots and lots of time with them. We don't know quite how much, but they were intimate with Jesus. He knew them well. They knew him well, you would think. They were his closest and most intimate companions. He gave them power. He didn't send them out without equipping them. You know, that's, uh, if we go about being equipped, you send our soldiers to war with um, maybe uh, lightly armoured vehicles, to quote a recent example. You know, that people are going to get killed. He didn't send them out unequipped. They didn't go in their own strength. They'd seen what Jesus had done. They had an example. And then he empowered them to do the same. He gave them rather strange instructions. Don't go to anywhere else but to Israelites. He calls it the lost sheep of the house of Israel. They were only sent locally first to their relatives, brothers, sisters, cousins, aunts, uncles, yeah. however the family extends out. In some ways, this is the hardest, as I'm sure you're aware. But they were going to people they knew and who knew them. And sometimes that's useful for us because our credentials are there before us. Yeah. If we've lived the life that Jesus gave us to live, then we have an in already. Yeah. They were told to preach. Now, I, um, I went to some school pastor training yesterday, and it was uh, very cold. Thank God for the heaters. <laughs> they hadn't turned the heating on in the part of the church that the school pastors were in, and the street pastors were there as well, and it was freezing. Okay, so I suggested perhaps that the street pastors, as they had to go out on the streets, and it was cold out on the streets, they would be better acclimatised by being in the cold room. And us who go into schools, the school pastors, we, you know, we would have a nice warm room, but nothing. Anyway, our trainer, B. Joy, was, uh, was talking to us about, and I, was, I had in my sermon before, that, to quote Francis of Assisi. And he said to us, um, who likes this, this from the truck? Francis of Assisi says, go preach the gospel, and if necessary, use words. And he put that in context for us. <laughs> Actually, he said, what was... The church and his family, they came from a very, very affluent area. And the place they were going to, where their church was and where they preached, was very poor. And Francis saw that that was a disagreement. They were preaching the good news of Jesus, when, that Jesus would supply all their needs, from a position where they were rich. So St. Francis of Assisi gave up everything to go become a monk, so he would identify with the people he was talking to. So he doesn't say preach and if necessary use words because words are useless. He said preach and if necessary use words because your words have got to have the same yeah. message yeah. as your life. Yeah, your words have got to have the same message as your life. If they don't, nobody's going to listen to you. Yeah. So they... The disciples went out and they had a message that was relevant to their people. In some ways, that's why they weren't told to take extra clothes or extra cloaks. So the places they were going wouldn't necessarily be the richest places. And then it would give them some dependent on them as well. Their relevance to their time, just as Paul spoke to the, about the unknown God in Athens, because it was relevant to the people, so they presented a message that was relevant to the people they were going to. And they were preaching about God being their supplier, so they took no provisions. They had to depend on the people they were bringing the message to. So they lived among them, 
and they preached to them and they were dependent on them for accommodation of food. They were somewhat vulnerable to the whim of the host city. And they said that word, that meant their words had to match their actions. They had impact, a strange impact on their host city. They brought peace. They imparted peace. I don't know what your house is like. We have a puppy. It is not very peaceful in our house when we're all there. But God, uh, they were said to take peace and impart peace to the houses they came to. If your house is anything like mine, peace is a rare commodity. <laughs> if you're the only male in the house, it really is a... <laughs> anyway, I'm not getting any lunch today. Good job I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I'm probably the noisiest in my family, if we're going to be really, really honest about this. <laughs> so uh, they don't have to kill me. Um, <laughs> but they brought peace. And peace, if you head back, any time anybody's spoken about peace, they've talked about shalom. Yeah. Nothing missing, nothing broken. Yeah. So this message they brought, and the way they lived in their houses, must have changed their situation completely. That message of peace. So do we have the same advantages? Yes, we have free access to spend time with Jesus whenever we want. Yeah. Actually, he's with us all the time. He doesn't go away from us. It's more the fact that we don't acknowledge his presence or hope he's not watching. Life rhythm, we, as in the office where I now work, I haven't always worked in the church, it's more relevant to that that I haven't, but we have prayer times. And we actually consciously come aside and pray for a short while to refocus ourselves on what God is doing. It doesn't mean we're any better than you, by the way. We have a prime opportunity. That might not be so workable in your, in your work, but we, have, we understand what advantage and, and mercy we have from God that we can do that. We have all the Bible. The disciples didn't have that. They wrote some of it. We have access to prayer. We have access to fantastic worship here. Fantastic sung worship. It's very good. I've been in places where it's been a lot different. <laughs> it's the only way I can put it. Sometimes I've led it where it's been a lot different as well. We won't go into that. And so we have all this availability. We get to choose much of the time, if we're not aware, what to do with our time. It's a choice we can make. So we have that advantage. Jesus also commands us to go. You don't need to tell me the scripture, do you? Matthew 28, 18 to 20. Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the earth. I saw something, um, I can't remember where it was now, but it was about now the Africans come to Britain to be missionaries to us. For reversal. What a reversal. Should that how it's be? Should it that be how it is? Ask yourself. But we don't also go in our own power. Come on. Day of Pentecost. Yeah. Suddenly, the Holy Spirit is given to everyone, yeah. whoever they are. Yeah. If, they've, if they accepted Jesus as their savior, you've got the Holy Spirit. Yeah. We don't go in our own power. We've been given power. Yeah. That authority that was given to Jesus, he has given to us yeah. to go and take the good news to wherever we go. We have a mission field right on our doorstep. We don't necessarily have to go to a remote location. We have a relevant message. What people need to hear. The hopeless need to hear hope. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim the good news to the poor. He has set me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. Again, going back to the school pastor training yesterday, 
They showed us a video, and this young lady was talking about how her life was and the pressures they face. And she actually said the word, because I'm under so much pressure and all these things come from every side, I'm oppressed. She acknowledged that she was oppressed. Our job to set up liberty, those who are oppressed. We have authority over sickness. All those things we have authority over so we can meet the needs of those that need a miracle. Our very attitudes and demeanour, our love and consideration, our showing interest in their problems and helping them to solve them can bring peace and wholeness to their lives. Do you realise the power of the message you have? Do you understand the power of it? It's not all preaching and miracles. Sometimes we just need to be present. And that's even with our children. Present is more vital than gifts. To be present. We have a God who supplies all our needs. And we are blessed to be a blessing. Steve's already told us that. What what, what we've tested them is, do we need more? If you give, God gives back to you. So surely should we have more of an impact on our neighbours and friends. Surely we should be doing that around us. But so do why don't we? Why don't we? Do we have excuses or reasons? You know, Jesus didn't have a lot of truck excuses. He tells a story of the wedding banquet. We used to sing a song about it, actually. And, and being young, we're not here. I used to sing a song about it with my family. Uh, the chorus goes, I cannot come to the banquet. Don't trouble me now. I have married a wife. I have bought me a cow. Don't no, get those two the wrong way round. You can get into a lot of trouble if you get those two the wrong way round. I'll let you with that out. I have fields and commitments that cost a pretty sum. Please hold me excused. I cannot come. So I can't stand before my saviour if there was a reckoning, when there's a reckoning, and give him an excuse. But you may feel your excuses are reasons and, you know, I don't know your situation completely. God does. Let him know. Let him work on you. I need to get to know Jesus better. That's one of our reasons, excuses. As I said before, Jesus didn't spend three and a half years with the 12 and then send them out afterwards. They got to try it out while he was still there with them physically in the body. He sent them out as a 12, he sent them out as a 70 later. The person who is responsible for developing your relation for Jesus Christ is not Jesus. It's you. It's me. I hold responsibility for that because I'm the one who determines my time. And he's quite nice. He doesn't bash into me. You know, he should cut off the telly, cut off the power, really, in my house. During the daytime, so all I can do is read my Bible. You know, that, that would be rude in our view. But he doesn't. He lets us choose to decide when we're going to spend time with him. Are we going to make that choice? Or are we going to leave it? It's not my ministry. Good one, this one. Another thing that, that the good friend BJ reminded us, he asked us to say, um, are you volunteers? Uh, yeah, we'll put our hands up, we're volunteers. He said, no, you're not, you're commanded. That's not an option, really. If we love God and we want to do his commands, and let's face it, we don't do his commands because he just tells us to, we do it because he loves us. Yeah. If we do it just because he commands us to, we're like the Old Testament. Yeah. We're like uh, the other religions. We do it because we love him and we want to serve him and we want to do what he told us to do. It's a reaction of love, not a reaction of fear. Perhaps we're not all called to be evangelists or missionaries. The fivefold ministry set them out a little bit differently. I'm not going to go there now because that's not my point. But we're still commanded to go. And I think we have, often have the wrong concept of going. Even to do sanctuary is not necessarily as far as we have to go. Perhaps we have to knock on our next door neighbour when things are a little bit troublesome for them. Perhaps you have to smile at them and say hello. (laughs) That is actually a very easy first step. Do you know the people? Do they acknowledge you when you go out because they know you? Or do you all ignore each other? 
You might have to go just to go to work or to college and school and live out your life there. Dare I say, you might even have to go in church. What do I mean? Well, we have opportunities in ministries that have people who don't know Jesus in them. We have the children's work, city kids. And their side department, that's on a Sunday. If you can't do Sunday, can you do Wednesday mornings? We have peas and pods where there is a whole bunch of people who bring their children or grandchildren into the church willingly (laughs) to sit and talk to people who are in the church. Captive audience, guys. And they need help. That's even better. You can be in there supporting the group. You don't have to change nappies. They're mums and with them. All right? There's no smelly nappy changing. All it is, you just have to talk. And most of us are pretty good at that. And city kids, it's the same thing. There's not, it's not real care. Dare I even say it more? City kids, a youth are not primarily there to teach your children about Jesus. You are. You are parents. Sorry, I'm a parent too. You are the people who teach your children primarily about Jesus by how you act, by what you do, by the actions you take in your house day by day. Kids, kids church, youth is just an extra. I'll talk about youth, shall I? Either they've done the hard work for you, the kids have brought their friends in. They've done the hard work. All they need is people to come and live like Jesus amongst them, to be mentors, to listen to them, to give them time, to show that they're valued, to show that they're loved. Bruner and David are leading this. It's fantastic. But the people are there. They need leaders. They need helpers. Your go could be coming here on a Friday night. So is that your go? They lived in my, uh, that could be your go. Our relatives. Now, I put myself in position here as well. I've got a father-in-law that's not saved. I know what it's like. I don't think my witness has always been as good as it should have been. Hardest place sometimes our relatives to preach. But we don't ever run out of an opportunity until they die. And you don't know the impact your life is having on them, whether negative or positive. Make it a positive one. When they, parts of families get argue, stay in the middle, be the peacekeeper. Don't take a side. It's simple stuff. That your go starts small. It starts little. Even being happy when everybody else is is miserable and grumpy. You say the joy of the Lord is your strength. (laughs) It might be here. When the music's going and the lights are going, is the joy of the Lord your strength when you're out with your relatives? When they're miserable, moaning about how the world is. Our integrity. Genuine love, concern and empathy. And even ministering peace to people. We often feel we need to preach a great sermon to those we meet. We don't. Live the life and make sure your life matches the words you preach. How about previous failure? Simon Peter, we love him, don't we? I've got to agree with Graham. He's a disciple that that I probably like the best because he messes up like I do. He messed up so many times, but he was still a disciple. He was still a follower of Jesus. Every time he messed up, Jesus restored him back, even to the point of denial. I mean, how bad can you get? Jesus said, you're going to deny me. Peter said, oh, no, I'm not. Five minutes down the line, I don't know Jesus. No, I've never seen him. I mean, how obvious is that? How easy is that? But even so, Peter was restored and drew up. Have you ever considered whether Judas, after betraying Jesus, if he'd have come and asked, he'd have been restored as well? Think about it. I've already blown my witness. Who's done that at their their work? Oh, so many times. I've already blown my witness. And they come and say to you, you're supposed to be a Christian. Why have you done this? Mm. But 
we don't understand that the grace of God applies to us time and time and time and time again. You've blown it, you start again. You've blown it, you fall off the bike, you get back on. Jesus was going there, grabbing desperately your hands to pull you back up and put you back on there. And it might be a bit uncomfortable for a time. But God will help you. Every day is a new day. New every morning are the mercies God gives. New, new every morning. You don't have to worry about them. The next day he's forgotten about them. In the past you can't change them, you can't do anything about them. Get up and be that person that Jesus wants you to be every day. I've already blown my witness at work. But if your boss come in here today, you say, what would you have done with the real Grand Baldwin? What have you done with the real Mike Collins? He wouldn't rec- would he recognise that you needed to be here and he knew you were here? That this is the place you would be? Or would he think, wow, what is that person doing in the church? Young people... Would your schoolmates or your teachers recognise you and know you were going to be here? Or would they think that's the child who runs with the bad crowd? You want things to be relative, re- relevant? Is that the child who runs with the bad crowd? Would your teacher come in here and not recognise the good person you pretend to be in church? Get this early, guys. Get this early because this will control the whole of your life. You get it right now. You know Jesus now and your life will be different. He's talking to you because he's calling you to be his disciples. If I could only get in here for 10 million years of my life and preach the gospel, that's a good 10 years. If you've got 60 years or 50 years, a change you can make to the world by how you live. God calls you young people. Graham, talk about singleness. You're single. You don't have the trappings of, of a relationship or of children. Now's your time to go on mission. Yeah. Yeah. I spent a year of Youth for Christ when I was after university. It's available to you. There are so many. There's YWAM. There's Operation Mobilization. You can even do it in the church. Are you ready and willing to do that? Do we put each other down as Christians? Perhaps that's what's holding you back this morning. And I feel for you. Because we take a moment, just some words, and we can kill people, other Christians, with our words. What we say, if it's negative, can destroy them. My brother Ben, we believe he had to give for interpretation of tongues. And he would interpret tongues until somebody told him, you're too young to be doing that. You're too young to be doing that. And he never did, as far as I'm going to know, ever again. What you say to people, whether young or old, is powerful in their lives. So had this morning you been rebuked by another Christian, God wants to restore you. It's not the end. It's just the beginning every time. It's just the beginning every time he calls you to come back and hear from him. Sometimes our obedience gets ahead of our reason to go. Vernon Rawlings, if you've ever read Adrian Blass, Vernon Rawlings had a whole list of, an endless list of ministries that he was doing that then failed and he started another one, never got anywhere. So our reason to go, sorry Mary and Central, Central, is because we love and we worship first. It's our worship to go. So I said what I said this morning, it's our worship to go. Wherever you do, you step out that door, you're still worshipping. You go to work, you go to school, you're still worshipping. It should be worship every step of our lives, everywhere we go. We need to love God before we go. You can get that here as well. You can feel the compassion he has for you and you can love him back. We can truly love our neighbour as ourselves. There is so so many opportunities. I'm no better at this than you are, but I would encourage you and strengthen you. I speak to myself too. So perhaps you're not the disciple at all. Perhaps you're just one of the crowd. Perhaps you're a critic. Perhaps you're a critic because the Christians who are around you haven't been living the life they were told to do. But yet it's not about them we spend so much time comparing ourselves to what other people are doing rather than doing the God that, God, job that God has given us to do. But let's not say, so let's come back to it. Are you actually a disciple? 
Have you made that decision to follow Jesus? Have you moved from being the crowd or just having a miracle to actually saying, I want to follow, I want to be a disciple? They're actually the same, pretty much the same words, but they show so, <clears throat> they identify so much more. To follow is to actively yeah. do the things that Jesus did and be obedient to his word and love him and want to be the person that he wants you to be. Perhaps you came this morning for something specific. Perhaps you have got an illness you want healed. Perhaps you don't need him at all. Or think you don't. I'm going to be real. I know there's people who think they don't need Jesus at all. But actually, don't leave it until the crisis of your life is so bad that you need him. Don't leave it there. He gives you purpose. He gives you hope. He gives you value. Because he wants to spend time with you. And the whole people, oh, yeah, give people value is to spend time with them. That they listen and hear you. Both for us and for Jesus, he wants to spend time with you. He gives you value because he gave, his, he gave his own life to save you. He was the son of God. You don't get bigger value than that. And yet his life was little to him to give it to you. And give you value, to give you hope, to give you peace, to give you love. After I've concluded, I'm just going to give you a brief opportunity to either stand up or join me at the front if you want to respond to any of these. But I have to ask myself, so what am I going to do? There's no point in me wasting my breath up here if there is no response from me and from you. We could have stood here in silence. Perhaps Holy Spirit would love to do that. (laughs) We're not volunteers. We're servants, obedient servants. And the call hasn't stopped. And it doesn't stop. The call is often there. Come and follow me. Come and follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Come and follow me. Go. Keith Green writes a song. Sorry to bring Keith Green up, but you know, occasionally I like his music. Jesus commands us to go. It should be the exception if we stay. It's no wonder we're moving so slow if God's children refuse to obey, feeling so called to stay are we going to let past failures stop us you know Jesus tells a parable about two sons and his father asks them to do something one says oh yes God I'll do it I'll do it I'll do it God's the father I'll go and do it doesn't go the other says no you're having to laugh aren't you I'm not going to do that but then goes the question Jesus asks is which one did the will of the father It's the one who actually went, not the one who's enthusiastic to go because he thought he was going to. So that's actually go. Your failure, you're put down from another Christian. It's not the end. Jesus is willing to restore you if you let him. He's willing to raise you up again, to bring you into ministry again, to bring you into discipleship again, to bring you into witness. It's not that you ever lost it, but you feel like you have. He's not like that. My Jesus brings me up and restores me every time. There are countless people in this place who will tell you that when they've messed up, Jesus has brought them back up. Jesus has brought them back into a place of fellowship with him. It's not the end, it's the beginning. Will you this morning move from being a disciple in name only to being a true disciple? And think about what you can do. Think about the small thing you can do. Are you going to do that this morning? Are you going to take the step of moving from being in the crowd to being a disciple? That's available for you this morning. This involves a commitment to have Jesus as the focus of your life, not other things. Heeding the call to follow me. This is what Jesus said when he meant you must be born again. You must be born from above. And that offer is still open. It's always open that Jesus comes and says, come to me, come to me, come to me. Hear that impact on your life. I have nothing more to say. I don't think there's anything more to say. But it would be remiss of me to stand up here and not give you an opportunity. And so, as Ari starts playing, you know, it hungry, close our eyes. And I want you to stand with me if you're willing now to say, actually, 
I want to be restored. I want to be a disciple. I'm going to commit to going wherever my situation takes me to go. I'm going to commit this morning to going and doing what God has commanded me to do. I'm also going to give you a brief opportunity this morning to respond if you want to move from being a disciple, to want to move from being a, one of the crowd to being a disciple. I'm not going to look. This is between you and God. But I'd ask you, if you do that, you find somebody to speak to afterwards who will lead you in the way to meet God, to meet his Saviour, Jesus Christ. see everybody standing here this morning you even see the ones that aren't standing Lord who can't make that step who struggle Lord and you bless them and your, your love flows upon them and for those who stand here with me Lord open opportunities show them Lord where you want them to go honour their commitment to you this morning honour their words and their, and their standing up this morning and show them places where they can impact their area, impact their neighbours, impact their family, impact their church, impact the world outside, Lord, who might be known as people who go and do your word and do your will and bring your gospel to the nation, bring your gospel to Gravesend by how we act and how we preach and what we say, we pray. Oh God put your power upon us. Holy Spirit, come again. Come again. Renew, 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 Lord God. Renew, Holy Spirit. Set a flame again, Lord. Fires have been put out. Relieve them, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name that you will be once again glorified and more glorified in this area, Lord. And, and City Praise Centre may have an impact on this area, we pray in Jesus' name. Thank you, Jesus. You are Lord of all. Amen.